Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I just have to comment, listening to the updates from the group so far, you know, it's really good to hear about all the early detection rapid response um, because that's the way to deal with many of these invasive problems. Um, unfortunately, TRAPA isn't really in the early detection rapid response uh, phase throughout most of its range right now. There are still some opportunities. Uh, but at least for the Hudson, the uh, proverbial horse has left the barn some time ago. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. So I suspect most people are pretty comfortable uh, with the biology and the history um, of this plant. You know, it was brought into, the, into North America intentionally and has been in the Hudson for well over 100 years. Um, and has gone through a couple of sort of uh, management treatments. There was an effort to get rid of it 30, 40 years ago. It was unsuccessful, and the uh, damage uh, was you know, worse than probably the plant is uh, because they're using Agent Orange, and so that was uh, backed off. And it, the, the plant now, one of the, one of the points I'll make is that it sort of reached its full extent uh, in the Hudson doesn't appear to be expanding, uh, sorry, expanding more within the system. Um, and so what we see is what we have, and, and one of the questions at the end is going to be what are we going to do about, about managing that, that plant. So there's a picture of it, but uh, I suspect almost everyone has seen it up close and personal. So in the, in the tidal freshwater Hudson, we have good inventories of how much of the plant is present where it exists. And this simply shows the cumulative acreage of both trappa in the uh, light pink um, and the, the native, uh, the most common native submerged species, which is Valisneri americana, which is generally viewed as more desirable than trappa uh, for a number of reasons. And I'll touch on this a little bit uh, as we go. So essentially in the Hudson, about 2% of the river bottom is covered. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot more of the submersed plant uh, than the invasive plant, although you talk to most people and they don't see it that way because the most visible and obvious part is the, is the trappa. Um, we recently completed uh, change analysis. Dave Strayer uh, worked on this um, as, as well. And so we, so we used the inventories or aquatic plants in the Hudson that had been done over about a 10-year period. The dates of the inventories are shown there. And um, tried to look at how much change had occurred, what was causing it, and we were specifically interested in the interplay between SAV, which again is largely Vallisneria, um, and, and TRAPA. And what you see from the TRAPA coverage in the gray bars there is it's been, been pretty stable. It goes up and down a tiny little bit. Uh, but not much. Uh, Vallisneria did show a decline in the last inventory, but that sort of pales in comparison to what happened after uh, Tropical Storm Irene came through. And then we had essentially a complete loss of Vallisneria from the main channel um, of the Hudson. And as of now, it shows very, very little uh, recovery. So we've gone through three um, low SAV years. Uh, Completely unexpected to me, the Trappa didn't seem to care that this storm came through, or Sandy the year after for that matter. And as best we can tell, uh, Trappa is everywhere it used to be. Uh, we do have aerial photos from 2014, so we'll be able to quantify that a little bit better. Uh, but essentially, you know, Trappa, uh, despite my perception that it, that's a fairly, you know, weakly rooted plant, uh, probably because of the extensive mm -hmm. seed bank, uh, it just popped right back. Uh, so Trappa uh, is tougher than I would have given it credit for, and Valisneri may be a little bit weaker than I would have given it credit for. But that's what happened as far as the change has occurred in the Hudson. Now, the habitat requirements are really the key, I think, for either knowing where the plant might appear knowing how any sort of restoration activities might create new habitat for the plant, which we probably don't want to do. And there have been a couple, uh, I'll just mention three uh, fairly quickly, and we can come back to these details on these in the Q&A if you like. 
um, you know, what are the habitat requirements? Would it be possible to either construct some habitat or reshape some habitat so that we're sure traffic could not occur there, yet perhaps the native uh, SAV Vallison area could occur there? Um, and to, to make a fairly long story short, um, we don't know. From being on the river and talking to other people, there's a sense that there is some physical difference in where traffic can occur versus where um, Vallisneria can occur. Uh, several, several efforts to sort of nail down what is the, what is the water depth what are the peak water velocities? What's the amount of turbulence that would separate the habitat for these two uh, plants? Um, no one so far has been able to, to pin down what those are. We tried some direct measurements of water depth in places that did or did not have trappa. Uh, we measured current velocities in places that did and did not have trappa. Um, couldn't really see a, a, a sharp demarcation. Um, in the change analysis I mentioned before, and that's been published and uh, the reference will be at the end of this. In that change analysis, we see a lot of interchange between Vallisneria uh, and Trappa. There are clearly locations where Trappa overspreads Vallisneria, and historically it has probably done more of that. Um, although again, I'll remind you, I think Trappa is sort of stable in its coverage right now. Historically, it certainly has overgrown trap of uh, Vallisneria. But we see the converse as well. We see places where Vallisneria has replaced uh, Trappa. So the two go back and forth, suggesting again this, this sort of habitat uh, condition is, is not dramatically different between the two, or at least there's not a sharp line uh, between the two. A group at Stony Brook tried to use um, the, the detailed bathymetry and a hydrodynamic model of the Hudson to look at modeled currents and peak currents and mean currents and water depth. And again, tried to, to, to differentiate where Vallisneria versus Trappa could occur. And again, to make a fairly long and complicated story short, short they were not able to find the sort of, you know, uh, you know, line in the sand that would separate where the two uh, species can occur. So I think as, as we go forward, if you're trying to make habitat for Vallisneria, you're simply going to have to be very, very um, aware that, that it is probably also suitable habitat um, for Trappa. Um, a couple of things that are pretty clear, the, the salinity tolerance of this plant, as most of you are aware, is, is fairly low, so we don't see it very far down in the Hudson. Uh, there's essentially none below about the Bear Mountain Bridge, um, you know, in general, for those of you that know the Hudson. That, that would be a few parts per thousand, so it, it doesn't tolerate that very well. Uh, it almost uniformly exists in soft sediment, but whether this is, you know, required for its establishment or it's an effect of having the plants there, we can't really tell. Uh, but for most of the places where we're worried about, you know, further invasions or, or spread of trappa, I don't think the sediment is probably the, the saving grace that will keep it out of an area. So this, this is a big problem, and I, and I wish we had the answer, and people have worked pretty hard on this, but where it can and cannot occur, um, it, it's not as obvious uh, that there's any sort of demarcation as one might like. So I'll just talk uh, quickly about the plant characteristics and, um, you know, one of the things that bothers people um, justifiably about uh, trappa is that it does form this very dense canopy at the water surface. And so measurements of the leaf area relative to the area of the bottom that's covered, it's several meters squared of leaf area per meter squared uh, of bottom. So it, it very definitely shades out um, any plants that might be, you know, rooted to the bottom underneath um, this, this canopy. On the plus side, this, this leaf area uh, provides, uh, you know, a lot of surface area for colonization by invertebrates, and I'll talk about some data that Dave Strayer collected in a, in a few minutes. So it is, you know, suitable habitat for epiphytic uh, invertebrates, and it also does dampen down 
uh, waves and slows currents. There's a lot of interest right now in sort of protecting Hudson shorelines from storms. Um, obviously, we and much of the rest of the state got hit pretty hard a few years ago, so there's a, a much greater awareness of how natural communities might be helping um, with some protection from the surge. Uh, the plant does take nutrients out of the water column, um, both directly to support plant biomass. Obviously, when the plant dies and decomposes, the decomposes those nutrients get returned. Um, I'll talk about the biogeochemistry just a little bit in a second, but uh, the physical uh, and chemical characteristics underneath these plant canopies also allow other processes of nutrient removal, denitrification being one of the, one of the keys. Um, and so again, denitrification in natural systems would be considered a, a, a positive attribute um, and improves water, water quality. So one of the things that gets talked about a lot with respect to TRAPA um, is the effects of the plants on dissolved oxygen. And this is something that's spoken about as though, as though it's almost uniformly um, really severe um, and really bad. And I don't think either one of those uh, is true. What I can say is that for the Hudson, where this has been studied pretty well by Nina Krakow, John Cole, um, and others, in the very largest trap of beds, and these are beds that are on the order of 100 hectares or more, DO does go to zero. And so for things that don't tolerate DO of zero, this is bad news. Uh, turns out that in the Hudson, um, simply because of the size distribution of the beds, the two very biggest trap of beds make up 50% of the total trappa area in the Hudson. So um, those two beds are sort of the, the poster children, if you will, for this DO effect. If you look at other size patches of trappa, and that's what the figure up above is, this is a, a patch size that represents, I think this is like the 75th quartile. So it's at the bigger end. Um, but it's not nearly the size of these mega beds that, uh, that John and Nina studied. You see a decline in DO, and at certain times that decline in DO gets down close to the, the state standard is four milligrams per liter. So that's sort of a relevant benchmark to, to keep in mind. So you do see effects on DO for the, for the you know, again, the larger size, but not the supersized trap of beds. Um, but most of the time, uh, these DO levels aren't likely to be causing any great damage to, to fishes or invertebrates um, or anything else. And in the Hudson, the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, the next tide replenishes that water. So you may get down close to four milligrams per liter at times, um, but it doesn't persist uh, for very long. And so when you look across so, so this DO effect is talked about as though it's uniform and disastrous in all cases, and I don't think that's true. I think the way to think about it when you look at other places that have TRAPA and whether or not you're likely to have this DO problem um, is you've got to think of the balance between the size of the patch and how well water exchanges underneath that canopy. So my two left-hand uh, examples with my uh, primitive artistic capabilities are where you would have adequate DO under a patch uh, of trappa represented by the green hexagon. So you could have a pretty big patch, but if you had good water exchange under that patch, you probably are not going to have a, a, a big, you know, low dissolved oxygen problem. The little example under that is simply if you have less water exchange, as long as you're looking at smaller patches, again, you probably are not going to have a DO problem. Um, in the right-hand examples, we're going to have problems with this, and I think the Mohawk is probably a good example, and many lakes would be good examples, is where you could have patches that you know, aren't necessarily terribly big, but you have poor water exchange for one reason or another. Um, either because overall flows are, are not very quick or because, you know, the, the patch of trap uh, occurs in some protected cove or something else that's going to impede water moving uh, back and forth. 
So this DO effect really does show up. It does matter. Um, it's not uniform, and I think what it varies on is this playoff uh, between size and water exchange. And um, you know, for a given system, you can probably make some logical guess ahead of time as to whether or not this is going to be a big deal um, or not. But it's not uniform, I guess that's the thing I'd like people to take away. Talk a little bit about the um, invertebrates. Um, again, the point is there's a lot of surface area um, in patches of, of water chestnut that's suitable for colonization by invertebrates. Uh, this is some work Dave did a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago. And uh, they compared unvegetated un areas um, the middle or the edge of trappa beds, the middle or the edge of Vallisneria beds. And what you see that, that it, I think is no surprise to anyone is that any vegetation that adds colonizable leaf area is better than an unvegetated area. It's not that there's something toxic or nasty about trappa that invertebrates won't colonize it. You know, you've got something on the order of a tenfold increase of, of invertebrates. Um, on trappa and possibly slightly higher than on the native plant because, again, the surface area of trappa is higher um, than for the native plant. So it's got habitat value for invertebrates. There's not much question about that. And it's probably not a big surprise, although people tend to, they tend to get this DO thing fixed in their mind and figure that everything else is just, you know, not worth looking at. And, and that's not quite true. The figure at the bottom right is simply a, an ordination of the, the species present, um, and they're very different in the trappa versus the, the Vallisneria. And Dave could go through the whole species list of, of who's different between the two, but they are quite different. But the numbers are there. Um, and so in, in many cases, from you know fish food point of view and things like that, they probably don't care who's there. They just want something for lunch. Uh, so the other issue is, is habitat for fishes, and in the Hudson there's been quite a lot of work about this, and again, a lot of it is driven by this, this idea that, that, that low DO precludes use as habitat um, in, in any trap of bed, and again, that's, that's uh, not true. This particular study was done in one of these uh, mega trap of beds that does go uh, to low dissolved oxygen, and essentially what these folks did is they set a, uh, a weir uh, to catch fish as they might be leaving the bed, the idea being that as, as you get later and towards low tide, dissolved oxygen goes down and the fish would be leaving the bed um, you know, as low as dissolved oxygen gets down to some sort of critical um, level. Um, what you see from this is that the catch per unit effort, so the number of fish that are exiting uh, the bed actually occurs at fairly high dissolved oxygen levels. And I think it's probably just a timing thing. I don't think that, you know, five and six milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen is going to drive any of these fish out of the, the bed. Mm -hmm. uh, they did gut contents on some of these fishes, the more common species, and they found that these fishes were clearly, you know, feeding on the invertebrates in there. So again, there's, there's, there's habitat for invertebrates. Those are suitable invertebrates to, to serve as fish food. And the fish from the channel are going in there um, and uh, having a little snack. And so, again, the, 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 the trap of bed uh, is providing some, some positive um, ecological value uh, for the river. So management, um, you know, you folks have already talked this morning about rapid detection. You know, if you've got places in the Mohawk, in a lake, that don't have trappa and you see a few plants pop up, absolutely, you know, get out there, get your volunteers, do whatever you need to do, pull them up, you know, pay attention the next few years because there will probably be a seed bank. Um, it's it's uh, clearly desirable, uh, well justified, you know, early detection is, is obviously the way to go. When you have a lot of this plant, um, and one of you spoke about, I forget if it was Champlain or not, but I know they've been uh, struggling with a trap in Champlain um, for a while. I kind of think that, you know, you might learn to live with them to some extent. Um, if they're a particular nuisance for boat traffic, which, you know, 
most people that understand ecology worry about the dissolved oxygen problem. Most people that are using the water body for recreation or, or, or fishing or something, they're more interested in the nuisance aspect. So there are things you can do, a, do about the nuisance aspect. Um, you know, you can deal with it mechanically around boat ramps or access to particular parts of a lake or, or something like that. Um, it may be that for the very biggest beds, if you sort of cut some paths through them, you might, um, you'll, you'll certainly create more edge, might be good for the opportunities for fish feeding. It may help with getting, you know, oxygen replenishment as water can get in through some of these um, tracks you might cut through the, uh, the plant beds. Um, some of the effects of these large beds are positive. You know, again, they do provide some protection from, from waves and currents. Um, the big beds that go anoxic, they do carry out denitrification. And so it, since we do have water quality problems in many places across New York, having places that will naturally do some denitrification um, is, is not a bad thing. And so, you know, the, the issue of managing trap is very much uh, pick your battles, know exactly what you're trying to achieve. Um, and uh, I, I know many of you are working with volunteers and citizens to go out there and either find it uh, or deal with it. Um, and I think the sort of, you know, small-scale directed removal is the way to go. We, we are not going to get rid of it from the Hudson. Uh, we're going to deal with it in certain situations and uh, learn to get along with it um, in others. So I think the last, yeah, so these are just some of the sources um, that I used for today, and there's there's a, a, quite a lot of literature on this this particular plant and its effects and habitat value and things like that. My email is there if there are follow up uh, questions. But I think at that I will stop, and we'll have some discussion or questions or however you want to do it.